I, I get to respond to Mark Kinzer. Uh, my mother-in-law likes Mark, and my mother-in-law barely tolerates me. Um, so, I mean, I think this is fabulous. Um, it shows what a mensch he is. Uh, Mark's 2018 volume, Jerusalem Crucified, Jerusalem Risen, is a masterwork of both exegetical clarity and theological grace. He has been, he has, better than any other book that I know, correctly summarized the standard scholarly approaches to Luke Acts and explained how they are driven more by a particular and particularistic Christian soteriological agenda rather than by close interpretation of the text. He gets it right, and he indicts the academic community in doing so. Mark has shared with me his remarks. Um, he's remarkably modest in his summary of the volume because it contains numerous more insights than a short paper such as his summary can encapsulate, and I would recommend it to you all. In many cases, I agree with him, which is a good thing for him to know, and it's a good thing for you to know, but that's not terribly interesting when you're doing a response, because then you just say, I agree with this and I agree with that, and you could just give your paper again and we'd all be fine. Um, so I thought it might be helpful to start with a few places where I do agree, and this may be surprising to some of you, um, so that we know that we're all on the same page, and then I'll turn to some areas of discussion. So points of agreement, a few among many. Rabbi Dr. Kinzer is right when he sees Messianic Jews as part of the Jewish people in the New Testament times. And as far as I can tell from a halakhic position, Messianic Jews have always been Jews. Nothing somehow changed in the year 70 or 135 or 200 or whatever. While well, many people today have a problem with hybridity and would like to place people into neat categories, just be a Jew or be a Christian, that's not the way the world works. The world is a messy and splendid place. Personally, I would rather have Jews who accept Jesus as Lord and Savior to con continue to claim their Jewish identity and indeed to be recognized as Jews by other Jews rather than have Messianic Jews simply become Baptists or Roman Catholics or Episcopalians or Presbyterians or whatever. And I would rather have their children know their Jewish identity as a living tradition rather than just a genetic marker. I think that's right, and I think Luke would agree. Well, because that's right. Um, on, Luke Acts, on Luke Acts, Dr. Kinzer is right in seeing the Gospels, and here especially Luke as well as Acts, as a response to history. It's not some decontextualized document, and especially a response to the Jerusalem Temple's destruction. I appreciated his comment, this destruction, as he puts it, is a theological problem to be confronted in grief and hope rather than a victory to be celebrated. And this reminds me, by the way, I didn't put this in, Mark has a copy of my remarks. Um, when you think about Handel's Hallelujah Chorus, they're not hallelujahing the birth of Jesus. The Hallelujah Chorus comes in at the, the destruction of Jerusalem. So to be wary of that. I think Rabbi Dr. Kinzer is also right when he speaks of Luke's anticipation that the Jewish people in Jerusalem will be present at the Parousia. And I think he's spot on in his following of Jakob Yervel in noting that Luke is doing damage repair to Paul's reputation with the concerns for circumcision, the Nazareth vow, and celebration of the holidays. Luke does love all things Jewish, and Luke delights in showing how Jesus and his followers love the same things. I'm just a little bit worried about how much Luke likes Jews other than Jesus and his followers, but we'll come to that. On Paul, Rabbi Dr. Kinzer, Dr. Rabbi, Mark. I just don't want to get you confused with the gospel. Um, although I guess you do proclaim good news too. Um, Mark is concerned, uh, is correct in noting Paul's celebration of his own Jewish identity in Acts. He does so, as we heard today from Professor Rudolph, also in his own epistles. Uh, Mark Kinzer is correct on Paul's approval of the Jerusalem temple and its worship. This is also the case in Romans. And Mark is correct on Paul's never suggesting that Jews give up their identity markers, and David Rudolph confirmed that this morning. I think that's all right. On Zionism, which is something that the book tackles, I thought eloquently, but Mark did not have much time to develop here today, but it's worth noting. I think Mark is spot on again when he sees from a theological perspective derived from the Bible a role for Zionism, 
But at the same time, from that same theological perspective, a Zionist should perfectly well be critical of the current government in Israel in the same way we should be critical of any government that does not well serve those under its control. But here's why Zionism is important theologically speaking and for the New Testament. For the Jewish people to exist in this age or any other, we exist as a people. And to exist as a people has certain requirements. I mentioned two. We exist in the body, which is why we insist on resurrection of the dead, because without a body, we don't have Jews. We've just disembodied something or other. So at some point, we must exist in a resurrected body, since Judaism enact is enacted in the body by what we wear, by what we eat, by, ha by what how and when and with whom we have intimate relations, by how we pray, whether men are circumcised or so on, bodies are important. But for a people to exist as a people, a people is, in, is inextricably connected to a homeland, because that's how we talk about people, or in the Greek, ethne, the Hebrew, am, um, or goyim. People have lands, Jews have a land, and that land connection does not disappear. And I think you made that case in the book really well. In other cases, I disagree, and I'll cite just three because that's what I get paid to do. Uh, these are a bit longer, and I'm not going to dwell on the disagreements. On the question of social location, which is where Mark began, I agree fully with Mark that social location matters for the contemporary reader. We cannot do exegesis without presuppositions, as Rudolf Bultmann famously said decades ago. What we bring to the text is part of what matters to us. So social location thereby matters. But I am less convinced that Messianic Jews are the best people to combine appreciation for an identity in the Jewish tradition with a sympathetic reading of Luke. And the reason I worry about this is because it takes me out of the equation. Because I think I do a pretty good job on Luke and I don't worship Jesus. So I think what we all need to do, regardless of our social location, is to read the text with some sort of generosity. I don't have to agree with Luke on his own Christology in order to know what his Christology is and therefore interpret his Christology generously. As an exegete and an historian, the issue for me is less, is Luke saying what is true? That's a theological question. And as I pointed out to a few of you, you know who you are. I am not a theologian. The question for me is not the truth claim. The question for me is, how can I understand what Luke is communicating, and how do I, in the role of a first century audience, an imagined role, understand um, that communication? So I worry about foregrounding my own social location too much, and therefore foregrounding your social location too much. Social location in an academic context, I think, is less a privilege than one hermeneutical perspective among many. Further, problems arise when we guess at the social location of the evangelists. The upshot is we don't know who wrote the Gospels, when, to whom, and with what sources. I don't think Luke was a Jew, but he likes Jewish things. Amazingly, you don't have to be Jewish in order to like Jews and Judaism, as many of you in your own shuls know. Um, I didn't think Luke was a Jew. The early church tradition did not think Luke was a Jew. We don't know who Luke was any more than we know whether Theophilus is a real person or the author's ideal reader. But we do know that Luke's text was preserved by the Gentile church and read primarily by Gentiles. Indeed, I do not find on the whole social location thing the foregrounding of insider versus outsider perspectives based on ethnicity quite as compelling as Mark does. The apostate is in one sense an insider, but the apostate writes from the perspective of an outsider. And I'll just give you one example of an apostate. And please know I do not consider Messianic Jews to be apostates, just so we're clear on that. I do not, for example, see Pablo Cristiani, the convert who represented the Catholic Church in the 13th century disputation in Barcelona, who attempted to have the Talmud burned and who insisted that Jews wear badges as quite an insider, or in Marx's terms, a member of the mishpacha. On the other hand, he is a halakhic Jew. So we have to worry about this whole ethnicity thing. Anyway, moving on. On Luke and the Jews, I want to agree with Mark on everything. 
You're a nicer reader, Mark, than I am, or I may be more cynical. But just as I'm pessimistic on the question of Luke and women, I don't think Luke is all that good for women. I think he likes us as long as we give money to the church and keep our mouths shut. Um, so I'm pessimistic on the question of Luke and the Jews. Yes, I may be, as a biblical scholar, impacted by or even co-opted by the scholarship that sees Luke as eliminating value of the Jewish tradition, because that's the stuff that Mark flagged that I've been reading for a good 40 years. But I actually don't think that's my problem, as I've been reading the same scholarship with the same eye toward anti-Jewish ideology as Mark has. I agree that Luke's infancy accounts foreground Jewish piety in history, because Luke 1 and 2, really, what's not to like? Um, I also think they are additions to the text, and that they are designed as an anti-Marcionite introduction. Not only do they evoke the Septuagint, they evoke Jewish bodies, sexuality, conception, parturition, circumcision, all that material, physical stuff, plus the Old Testament that, Mark, that Marcion really didn't like. But I'm less positive that the point of the infancy materials is to recover Jews and Judaism as opposed to co-opting the Septuagint than Mark does. But on the other hand, it would be nice. I think the first two chapters set up the view that only Jesus and the people associated with him get Judaism right. For me, Luke Acts also ends with the only one true, good, fabulous, righteous Jew in all of Jerusalem and Rome as well, and that would be Paul. I'd like to know where those thousands of other Jews were after Acts chapter 21. They go missing. As I've said about John's gospel, and I think the point holds for Luke as well, Luke likes all things Jewish, including the Septuagint. It's just non-Messianic Jews Luke doesn't like very much. And even among the Messianic Jews in Acts, I find the Pharisees to remain more of a problem than a potential. Mark did not, did not have much chance to unpack his comments on Gamaliel. They are in the, the text that I have, and he's got a whole section in the book on that. Um, even Gamaliel, wh whom Mark likes, I like him too. You know, I would date him. Um, um, I don't think Gamaliel in Acts 5 makes a good argument. Mark cites, Acts, cites Gamaliel's works in Acts 5, 38 through 39. This is Gamaliel speaking. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away, away from these men and let them alone. Because if this plan or this understanding is of human origin, it will fail. But if, if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be found fighting against God. Logically, this is a terrible argument, and I think Gamaliel could have done better. Longevity is not a sign of divine will, as we see from teachings older than the gospel, including teaches, teachings of anti-Semitism, along with racism and homophobia, and so on. Wahhabism has been here for centuries, and I don't see how Wahhabism is the word of God. Gamaliel is about as good a non-Messianic Jew gets in Luke Acts, and he's simply wrong in comparing Ju Jesus with Thutis uh, and with the Egyptian. I think he gets it wrong. He tries. He misses. Mark Kinzer correctly notes that, quote, every time the story takes another step outward from Jerusalem out, it concludes that stage of the story by returning to Jerusalem. Eh, maybe. You may be right here, and this is not a matter of history, it's a matter of literary critical appreciation. On the one hand, Peter leaves Jerusalem and comes back, but the last time we see Peter in the book of Acts is Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council, and then he goes missing. After Acts 21, Paul will leave Jerusalem and he will not return, nor need he, because he is, by his own words, the apostle to the Gentiles. I find that Luke often plays with a particular theme only to explode it. And we see this also in folklore and the so-called rule of three, where two scenes set up a third. So once you think you've got the pattern, Luke comes in and says, maybe not so much. For example, the priest and the Levite in the parable of the Samaritan give way not to the Israelite, the expected, but the very unexpected Samaritan. The singular lost sheep and the singular lost coin give way to the double two lost sons and a dad who forgets to invite his older son to the banquet. Um, 
maybe the patterns eventually break rather than simply continue. At least as the book of Acts has it, the trips to Jerusalem finally stop. The mission is out from but no longer back to Jerusalem and the Jerusalem mission will have to wait until Jesus returns. And Paul, deserted by the members of the way on his final trip back, becomes the only good Jew in Jerusalem and he's taken away in chains. Now granted, this is an argument from absence, and absence of evidence is not the same thing as evidence of absence. So if Mark is right, and he may well be, we simply put in the next trip back. If I'm right, because I tend to stop at the end of the book, then we have a problem. We can choose how to read Acts, and that may be one of the gifts of Mark's book, is he chooses how to read Acts, and we can make a choice here. To get to Mark's point, we need to read beyond the text of Acts into history, and that makes me nervous because we know what happened when history played itself out. The only one to return to Jerusalem in this whole scenario is actually Jesus, and in Mark's view, he's not returning until the Jews greet him. We need to be around, but the primary reason is not for our own existence, but for messianic witness, at least as I read Luke Acts. Nor is Paul's job to evangelize, evangelize us Jews because, as noted, he tells us repeatedly, his job is to evangelize the Gentiles. Finally, on the Jerusalem Council, which is also developed much more in the book than in Mark's talk. Um, I don't think, uh, and here Mark and I disagree, that the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, clear on the Jerusalem Council? Good, I like talking to you. Um, is about Leviticus 17 and 18 and sojourners in Israel. I don't think it has anything to do with the Ger Toshav. I think it's about keeping Gentile believers out of pagan temples, because that's where you'd worry about meat offered to idols. But I do think Mark is correct that Jesus, Paul, James, and the whole crew uphold Torah, and that Acts never, abrog never abrogates dietary concerns or Sabbath or circumcision or holidays. The problem in Acts 15 is not Jews and Judaism, it's what to do with the pagans. Okay. There are other places where we can go page by page and say, I don't agree with this, I want this nuance. But I thought for the time I have with you that more interesting for me and ideally for you are the places where in conversation we might be able to tease out some additional implications of Mark's fine work. So in the time that I have remaining, I want to focus on seven because you go for seven, um, of the many areas where I think productive conversation can be held. Thus, rather than focus on my disagreements, I want to begin with the perspective of, let's say Mark Kinzer is right about everything, and I really wish you were, okay? but let's say you're right about everything and ask, what do we, and the we here means everybody in this room, what do we, as well as others who read Mark's work, what do we do with his arguments now? He's right, what's the payoff, what's the so what? So I'll list my seven themes and then I'll unpack them. Right? The relation of Jesus to the people of Israel, the claim that Jews and Christians today are estranged covenant partners that need each other, what canon is best for the Messianic Jewish community, the meaning of Israel in the sense of the people Israel, or more broadly speaking, Jews, the question of whether God is or we are in exile, the eschatological timetable and what is holding up the parousia and the matter of mission. But we can do this efficiently. On the connection of Jesus, trust me, on the connection of Jesus to Israel, the first and potentially most disturbing aspect to me of this work, um, although from a messianic theological perspective, I can see how you get there, um, are Mark's repeated notes connecting the cross to Israel. So here's a, two quotes from the book and then one quote that you heard this afternoon. By his suffering and death, Jesus anticipates and shares in the destruction of Jerusalem of 70 C and the Jewish exile that follows and imparts to those later events a redemptive character that becomes manifest in the course of Jewish history, page six. He also speaks of, quote, the atoning death of Jesus and how it is, quote, linked to the future suffering of the Jewish people. It's page 15, and the theme is repeated throughout. In his remarks today, Mark summarizes, Yeshua voluntarily enters into solidarity with his people in the sufferings they are destined to undergo. So we have Jesus connected with Israel's suffering, and somehow all of the suffering is redemptive. 
So I'm not a big fan of giving meaning to tragedy. Uh, for, t for me to find something redemptory about 70 would also require finding something redemptory about the Nazi era. Marx speaks of, quote, how evil disease perpetrated by free human actors become the means through which divine redemption is accomplished, that's the book, page 17, and how 70 was, quote, a source of purification and corporate renewal, page 21. Um, if this is right, then the end justifies the means, and I don't want to go there either. Uh, for Jesus to accept his role as Israel and to become, in Mark's words, the quintessential martyr is not, to me, the same thing as being a victim of war or genocide, because Jesus had a choice. The Jews mowed down by the sword or lift up on Ro lifted up on Roman crosses in 70, or shot and burned by the Nazis, had no choice. I'm uneasy with this connection. Yet Greenberg famously stated, no statement, theological or otherwise, should be made that would not be credible in the presence of burning children. To claim that any tragedy that has befallen Jews as a people is redemptory, strikes me as failing Greensburg, Greenberg's test, as well as compromising the question of theodicy as to make belief for me untenable. So what do we do with the idea of benefits to suffering? Are there benefits to 70? Are there benefits to the Nazi period? Are there benefits to every tragedy that Jews have suffered? And if the idea is at the end it all works itself out, that's insufficient for me. So what do we do with that? Number two, I appreciate Mark's view of both church and synagogue as having lost something in the separation. And we did. We lost stuff. Jews lost uh, a, a gift for celibacy. That drops, out, that drops out of Judaism. It's there in Second Temple Judaism. Uh, Christians, on the whole, sing much better in major harmony than anybody in Michel. I mean, there, there are differences. It's, it's fine. I, I agree we have lost something. Mark seeks to show from theological and exegetical positions that we Jews and Christians, you all are in between here, are estranged covenant partners, each of which needs the other to be whole. For me, the problem is not theological or exegetical, but sociological and ethical. I think we non-Messianic Jews, here I'm speaking for the, the rest of the mishpacha, I think we non-Messianic Jews should do more in welcoming our family members who proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior. Why? Um, not only is it halakhically appropriate, it's an ethical issue. I have f seen far too many instances where Jewish families have become dismembered because one member has become Messianic, and I think that's awful. To me, halakhically, the child of a Jewish parent, or at least the mother, is a Jew, and believing in Jesus does not change that essential definition. So we Jews need to do something about this broken family relationship. That I agree. Mark has made the case for the church, Christians broadly defined, to welcome Messianic Jews, qua Jews, on the basis of his reading the New Testament, and that makes sense to me too. But on what basis does this welcoming get traction in Jewish circles? So Mark has made the case for Christians to pay attention, but how do we bring that estranged community together? What text do we use? if Messianic Jews are talking to non-Messianic Jews. Use of the Tanakh is not helpful because we will disagree on various interpretations. Will rabbinic sources be of help? Perhaps. And perhaps this is a place where the Messianic community, which means you all, uh, might do more work on the graduate level in rabbinic sources and then be developing that because I think that's which, where the traction's gonna go. You know to whom I am speaking. <laughs> Third, a softball question on canon. I am actually curious as to what text the Messianic Jewish community should claim. On the one hand, Mark insists that the New Testament with Tanakh is authoritative scripture which shapes our, that is the Messianic community's lives. But the New Testament is substantially dependent upon the Septuagint, and it's the Septuagint that the New Testament tends to cite. So what role does the Septuagint play in the Messianic community? more. The Septuagint by order ends with Malachi, and that's a much better fit for a messianic focus. So you end with the prophets, and then you hit boom into the New Testament, and it gives you promise fulfillment. That's a much better order than ending with Second Chronicles, which nobody reads anyway, right? um, although it does have a nice ending. 
So why not use the Septuagint since that is the text the followers of Jesus who composed the books found in the New Testament primarily used, and that way you get to have the books of Maccabees, the wisdom of Solomon, Judith, and Tobit, and all that other stuff for which I have canonical envy. Why, indeed, talk about a Brit Hadashah if you don't have an earlier Old Testament? Right? Um, so I understand why you might want to use the Tanakh, because it brings you closer to the synagogue, but is that really the right text to be using? I think that's worth discussing. Okay, fourth. I am curious as to how the claim that the divine election of Israel is irrevocable fits with the various definitions both Tanakh and the New Testament give for Israel. Jesus denies Jews in the Gospel of John, including Jews who believe in him. Uh, he says, you're not descended from Abraham, you are really children of the devil. Matthew creates a new Israel of sorts, although Matthew never uses the term new Israel, out of the 12 disciples, and then sends them off on a Gentile mission, which on a side note always bothered me, because I thought Peter was supposed to be the apostle to the Jews, so why is he being told, go make disciples of all the Gentiles? My preferred translation of Matthew 28, 19. Paul says in Romans 9, 6, not all Israelites truly belong to Israel. So what do we do with Luke and Israel? I took a cue from Mark, because Mark's very good at word studies and repetition of terms and nuances of terms, so I thought, I'll just see where Luke uses the term Israel and see what we get. Luke uses the term Israel a number of times, but often in ways that suggest a lessening at best of approval of Israel as Jews and approval of that identity. The first two chapters love Israel, 116, 54, 68, 62, 25, 32, and 34, and Israel is fabulous. And then we get into the rest of the gospel. Uh, in Jesus' synagogue sermon in Luke chapter 4, uh, the widows in Israel are the ones who were bypassed for the, widows at, for the widow of Zarephath, and the people with leprosy in Israel are bypassed for Naaman the Syrian, so much for the privileges of Israel. In Luke chapter 7, verse 9, Jesus announces that the centurion's faith surpasses any in Israel. Or we have Israel placed under the authority of Jesus' followers who seem to sit above it. Luke 22, 30, talking about the disciples who will, quote, sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Or Israel functions as a site of misunderstanding as on the road to, Dema to Emmaus, where the two tell Jesus, I think one of those is, this Clopas and I think the other one's a woman, because why not? Um, where the two tell Jesus, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. As for Israel and Acts, Israel is the Christ killer. Acts 4.10, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man standing before you in good health by, is stand, this is the paralytic who gets healed. This man standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you, i.e. the people Israel, crucified, whom God raised from the dead. As Mark writes about Stephen's speech, Stephen tells his accusers, quote, that in fact they will be responsible for the coming destruction, for it is their hostility to Jesus and his disciples that will provide divine judgment. And so Jerusalem, i.e. Israel, the Jews in general, are destroyed because they do not follow Jesus. Further, the failure of Israel, and here in Mark's sense of the organized community, I just laughed when I first saw that because I thought, Jew is an organized community? You're kidding, right? That requires some sort of eschatological special grace. Um, so Jews in the sense of an organized community, or as Mark puts it, corporate response to Jesus, quote, results not only in the delay of the restored kingdom, but in an intensi intensification of the sufferings of exile. That's the book, page 142. I read this as saying, and if I misunderstand you, please, you will, you will, because you will, correct me, um, that we Jews corporately are to blame for our own sufferings, and the way we stop anti-Semitism is to welcome Jesus. Well, that's not the way it worked in the Nazi period, and I'm not sure it's going to work now either. And it's also not a message that's going to go down well in my orthodox shul. Now, I think Mark can counter all these examples about Israel. I'm pretty sure I could do so as well. But I think they need to be articulated just in terms of how the word is used. So to refocus this concern, to put that question number four succinctly, from your messianic perspective, what exactly is this Israel today 
to which the Messianic Jewish community belongs. What is Israel? Fifth, Mark, following Tom Wright, sees Jews at the time of Jesus as still in exile. Book, page 55. Wright helpfully characterizes the practice of fasting as a corporate Jewish response to exile, or in his remarks for today's presentation, as N.T. Wright has suggested, this journey of Yeshua to Jerusalem should be viewed against the backdrop of the prophetic anticipation of God's return to Zion. Well, while Mark does not agree with Tom Wright, and neither do I, uh, that Jesus literally fulfills Isaiah 40 or 52, since the triumphal return is at the end of the age, I am curious about this view of Jews in exile in general and of God in exile in general. I don't think Jesus has to show the people God is returning to Zion because at the time of Jesus, God hadn't left yet. So at best, the message is proleptic, which meant nobody who was among his followers got it. I do not think Jews at the time of Jesus saw themselves as in exile or saw God as fleeing from the temple and so going into exile. Thus, I have problems with Mark's claim, quote, the Roman conclusion of Acts may be viewed as further evidence for the author's vision of exile as both enduring and potentially redemptive. And again, I don't like the idea of exile as redemptive. I can see where after 135, Jews found themselves not just in diaspora, which some of them liked very much, uh, Third Maccabees, for example, but in Galut, in exile. But I do not see this exile to be the case for Jews at the time of Jesus, or even necessarily when Luke Acts was written. The bigger disaster, I think, was not 70, but 135. Why? Because Rome typically rebuilt temples after raising them. You, things calm down, and then you rebuild. If God is in exile for the Jews at the time of Jesus, or in 70, then what is to prevent opponents of Jesus from seeing God in exile from the time of the ascension on. You can make that argument. Six, I'm worried about Mark's timetable. Then again, Luke was worried about Mark's, not this Mark, but the other Mark's timetable. Mark the Gospel, not Mark Kinzer. Uh, for Mark Kinzer, the re your mother should have named you something else. To name you after a Gospel writer is really unhelpful, right? For Mark Kinzer, the return of Jesus and the full blossoming of the Messianic age are dependent on the Jewish welcome of Jesus. As Mark Kinzer puts it, that hope is centered on the return of Yeshua, which will be precipitated by Israel's national repentance, which will accomplish Israel's national restoration. Otherwise put, we non-Messianic Jews and ha have been and likely will continue to hold up the Messianic age. So when I'm putting this paper together, I mentioned it to my husband, who's an academic, he's a, a Jew, professor of modern Jewish culture, Mark knows him, um, and I said, maybe we should move to Israel to help get the program going. Um, my husband is allergic to sesame products, which makes him, as he puts it, an anti-sesamite. Um, <laughs> and then he, na he then announced, I'm not relocating, it's too dangerous with all the hummus. So blame it on our family. Um, Mark Kinzer reads correctly, Luke 13, 36. See your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And Mark sees that as indicating that Jesus will not return until Jerusalem or the people Israel or whatever we call this group, Jews in the land of Israel, welcomes its Messiah. Otherwise put, when his people bless him, the Messiah will come. Well, I appreciate the idea of Jews being the historical pivot for universal time, although it does sound a tad dispensationalist, but I am worried about Jews holding things up. Um, I have suggested in other writings that faith is not like Sudoku. It is not a matter of connecting the dots or putting the pieces together or finding through logic that Jesus is Lord or that he is not Lord. Faith is like love and love comes somehow into your heart and it frequently bypasses logic. If we non-Messianic Jews are holding up the show, we are not doing so for lack of logic. We are doing so because we have not had that resurrection experience, however defined, that the Messianic members of our family have had. It's not that I deny faith, it just never happened. You can pray for me if you want, that's fine. Um, now, we non-Messianic Jews are not gonna get this Messianic view by proof texting or witnessing. 
Even the story of the road to Emmaus, where Jesus does what looks like a very high-end biblical study seminar to explain to Clopas and maybe Clopas' wife that his life, suffering, death, and resurrection were predicted in the scriptures of Israel, they still don't get the point. They get it in the combination of the breaking of bread and then in the miraculous moment when, as Luke 24, 31 puts it, then their eyes were opened, theological passive, and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They don't see because they have been divinely prevented from seeing, their eyes were closed, and they won't see until their eyes are opened by an external divine factor. And so it seems to me that Luke is leaving the fate of the Jews to the parousia. So are we Jews actually the problem? And if so, what, if anything, is to be done about us? Finally, for a seventh theme, the matter of mission. And here I'm thinking of the earlier use, and we've heard it today, of post-missionary Messianic Judaism. Acts ends with Paul in Rome with the, with the intent to speak to the Gentiles. Matthew ends with the Great Commission, which as I mentioned, I think should be translated, make disciples of all the Gentiles. Matthew doesn't say make disciples of all the Gentiles and screw the Jews. The original commandment to the lost sheep of the house of Israel was never abrogated, but the focus on the mission shifts in Matthew. Matthew sees the future in the Gentile church. Paul speaks of all Israel being saved, and when he speaks of all Israel and Romans, I really think he means all Jews, but that's not gonna happen now because a hardening, or as Mark Nanos puts it, a callousing has come upon Israel for the present term. Jesus is not, in Mark Kinzer's configuration, going to return unless we Jews welcome him, if I've understood the timetable correctly. So what do these data mean in terms of mission? Do we wait for God to do the divine work of getting us non-Messianic Jews to sign on to the program? Or should the mission to the Jews ostensibly given to Peter and so to Messianic Jews continue. And if it should, what role is that mission to be? What does it look like? And who continues it? On the one hand, the New Testament makes it pretty clear that the only way anybody's gonna get the message is by divine grace. On the other hand, surely there should be some opportunity to hear it in the first place. So what do we do? I've got lots more questions from issues of understanding particular biblical verses to theological and soteriological and additional historical concerns. I think Mark's program is basically exegetically sound. I may not agree with him in all cases, but he's in, within appropriate exegetical parameters. There's room for discussion. He's not off the wall. He, he may actually be the handwriting on it. I think his program is theologically coherent, which is nice because theology is not often coherent. And I think it's also pastorally sensitive. I wish we could spend an entire week going over this book paragraph by paragraph and discussing and chewing and mulling and debating because that's what Jews do. But at the end of this talk, what I do want to say is Yasha Koach, Mark, because you have given us all much to celebrate and much to discuss. Thank you. Well, I usually admire AJ's unique blend of precision and concision, uh, her, her ability to say so much, so well, so quickly. Uh, but in this context, um, I do, I'm, I'm not as grateful for it because there is so much uh, <laughs> that I would love to say, and I don't have the gift that she has to be able to say so much so well, so quickly. So I'm not going to, I'll do what, what I can. One of the things I'm grateful for is um, particularly in the, uh, the implications that you laid out. Um, many of them are really questions for all of us. They're, they're not really just questions directed at me. Uh, and I think that's, that will be helpful for our discussion. Um, but there are uh, a number of things I would like to, uh, to touch upon. Uh, first of all, um, I do think the issue of social location needs a lot of uh, nuancing. Um, 
I think that, uh, I, I still think that the Messianic Jewish social location is an asset because it hasn't existed before. I, I'm not trying to make the case that it is um, the privileged uh, perspective for reading Luke and Acts, or even for being able to understand everything that Luke and Acts have to say about Jews and, uh, and the Jewish people. I think it's an, a necessary, a recapturing of a necessary environment in which people are living and thinking and interacting with the text. Um, I think the academic environment itself is a crucial social location, uh, which uh, operates in it, in, you know, according to different rules. One of the things it, academia does it, is for the first time bring together Jewish and Christian scholars interacting over the same text so that you get Christian scholars studying uh, rabbinic texts with, with Jewish scholars. You have Jewish scholars studying the New Testament as we're seeing over this week. Um, you know, with, um, with, with Christian scholars and also now with us as, as, as Messianic Jews. These are, these are the creation of new social locations that, um, because study and interaction with text is not just an individual process. It's not me sitting in my bedroom or in my study or the library reading a text. It, it, it's the reading and study of texts is something we do together. Um, and so who that we is who are doing it together impacts what we end up seeing within the text. So um, I, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's enough on, um, on social location. I'm also, well, I, I do happen to think Luke is probably a Jew. It doesn't really matter that much to me. Um, if, if he's not a Jew, uh, he's, he's clearly someone who strongly identifies with, the, uh, with Jewish life. Um, which is the crucial thing for me. That's why the, it's not so much uh, the issue of ethnicity here, uh, as I think your example of, of Pablo Cristiani brings out. It's a question of identification. Um, is a person, if a person if a, is raising issues that are critical issues, are they doing it as someone who is on the inside in the way they are identifying? Are they identifying um, raising an issue like I would do with my reservations about, say, the um, Messianic Jewish movement. You know, I have criticisms of the Messianic Jewish movement, but they're, it's very different. I'm, it's my movement. I'm part of it. I don't dif distance myself from it. It's not something else. It's something I'm part of, and it has weaknesses and, and limitations and problems. That's really different than somebody from the outside, you know, slinging uh, 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 arrows at us. So, um, that's enough on, uh, I think, on social location. Uh, I think this recurring issue that, that AJ raised, which I think is the fundamental difference between us, has to do with this, uh, the issue of Luke and the Jews and the, uh, the Jewish people and, and Luke's attitude towards it, the Jewish people. And I think she's, um, I mean, that as, uh, as, as AJ mentioned, I think at the end, and as I really was trying to point out in, in my oral presentation here, uh, you know, f for me, it's a starting point. It's not like I, I've simply pr trying to present myself as someone who's reading Luke and Acts as this totally neutral, objective observer. Uh, and it's simply, this is what the text says. How can you not, how can you not see it, AJ? No. I want Luke, I need Luke to be able to be saying this. I acknowledge it. It's the choice. Yeah. And the, the question is, can the case be made in a plausible way, in a way that's least equally plausible or compelling to the, the opposite cases? Because for one, my whole, my whole hermeneutical approach to scripture is one where I, I happen to think that there are many, many issues where um, w the best that uh, historical critical scholarship can do is to eliminate totally implausible hypotheses or theories. And that what you're left with are several competing uh, theories that are equally plausible um, and where it's very difficult to adjudicate um, uh, between them. Um, and what that means, though, is you end up having to make a decision on some basis that's actually external to the text. 
and we ought to acknowledge that when we're doing it. Um, so uh, I've made some choices here. Um, I think they're reasonable choices. Uh, I, for me, the, the question of Gamaliel is, is absolutely critical. So that's why I, I kind of, I'm, I was um, uh, very unhappy. I'd put that at the very end of my paper. And so that was the part I had to cut out, you know, when I uh, had gone through um, too much time, taken up too much time. Uh, I am uh, much more sympathetic to uh, Gamaliel's case, I, uh, his argument in Acts 5. Uh, I read it a little differently than AJ. I don't, I'm, I don't think what Gamaliel is saying is that whatever happens in history is God's will. Uh, I, I think, I, what I think, what I see Gamaliel saying, or what, what Luke presents Gamaliel as saying, is that if there's something that is essential to the outworking of God's purpose, God will intervene in such a way as to be sure that it doesn't, it, it doesn't die out or isn't eliminated in such a way that it couldn't possibly be recovered at some future point. Uh, and uh, what that means, though, is that if something ulti ultimately does die out in a way that's irrecoverable, then I do think Luke would say that must not have been something from God. And I, my reading, again, of Gamaliel's speech, not from Gamaliel's perspective, but from Luke's perspective. See, I think it's crucial to read read this as, what is Luke, after 70, looking back at, uh, at Gamaliel and looking back at the Sadducees who he's presented as, as more vigorously the enemies both of Yeshua, the apostolic community, um, and, and Paul. Why, why, what is Luke trying to say in all of this? And what I'm arguing is that what Luke is trying to say is that uh, Gamaliel is speaking in an almost kind of prophetic way, anticipating the, the irrecoverable end of the Sadducees and their rule um, uh, over the Jewish people, and anticipating the rise of his own descendants. You know, because if you think about Gamaliel, uh, the grandson of Gamaliel the Great, who is this key figure, according to Jewish tradition, in the regathering of uh, Jewish life post-70, around the time when, when Luke is writing. You know, and now the reason this is so critical to this issue of Luke and the Jews is that I'm, what I'm trying to argue is that what, what Luke is presenting in terms of the oppositional nature of hoiudaioi in, in Acts towards, towards Paul is something that reaches its climax in the, the destruction of 70. And that then, once the dust clears, there's like a different, a different picture now of who the Jewish people are and who the leaders are. And suddenly, it's, it's, it's the people who are closest to the, the Messianic community. Those who are, they're not part of the Messianic community, they're, they're, uh, they haven't simply accepted the message, but they've been more open than anybody else. And now they're the ones in charge, rather than the ones who've been most inimical. Uh, and if that perspective is justified, then what that means is that Luke's attitude towards the Jewish people is the attitude that he has towards Gamaliel there and the Pharisees, rather than the attitude he has towards the Sadducees or the, the, the opponents of Paul. So this is why it, uh, that, that issue is so critical of how we understand Gamaliel. And then, of course, I see the emphasis on Paul as the disciple of Gamaliel uh, as a way not just of, uh, of adding cred to Paul. It's also a way of adding cred to Gamaliel. It links the two in, in some sense. It links uh, the new movement, these two movements, that have survived the fire, the fire of 70. Um, so um, 
that's, uh, that's enough on uh, Luke and the Jews. Just a couple of other, how, yeah, how much time? Yeah, sure. Do you want to say anything so far to? The, the one thing that I want you to say a little bit more about Gamaliel, when, when, you, when you mentioned Paul's being, uh, at least according to Acts, Paul was a student of Gamaliel. Paul never tells yeah. us that himself. Um, and I'm wondering, okay, so what did Paul learn if he sat at the feet of Gamaliel that turned him into a persecutor? I mean, what kind of seminar was that? And that's where I, I find Gamaliel much, much more problematic than you do. Uh, yes, well, I think one, just one point I would make on that is when it does describe Paul as a persecutor, he's not sent by Gamaliel, he's sent again by the high priest. Uh, and so it is, again, the Sadducees who are sending him rather than the leaders of the Pharisees. Uh, and in fact, then, if you read about Paul as a persecutor, in the light of Gamaliel's speech. I think what you would say is he was not a good disciple of Gamaliel. He becomes a better disciple of Gamaliel after he encounters Yeshua on the, on the, the, the road to Damascus. So, um, I think that's a good recovery. <laughs> Do you want to say anything else before no, I go on? I, I'd like to say to you. Okay. Well, uh, I, I, I think the point the, in terms of the return to Jerusalem, uh, I'm glad that um, A.J. raised this issue of Paul, uh, that Paul doesn't come back to Jerusalem. Now, for Peter, I think what you, the key thing is that Peter drops out of the narrative. He doesn't l leave Jerusalem and not come back to Jerusalem. He simply disappears, um, and, and Paul takes his place. Now, Paul does leave, and... Um, and, and it ends up in Rome. Now, one hypothesis I would like to explore in the future that's not in the book, I'd, I'll test it out on you. I, 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 you probably won't like it, um, but I like it. Uh, one, of the thi one of the characteristics of Luke's treatment of Paul in Acts and uh, Yeshua in Luke is at certain points, many, many commentators have noted, there's a, uh, a parallelism between them. Uh, and so, you know, Paul, uh, you, so, you know you sh the narrative of Luke is built around this great journey uh, f for Passover, for the Chag uh, of Yeshua coming to Jerusalem where he is arrested and then he's crucified. Uh, for Paul, it's built around this great journey of Paul coming back uh, to Jerusalem at Shavuot, where he's arrested. Um, but, he, but Paul is not executed. Paul is, um, Paul, Paul is ar arrested and then ultimately sent to Rome. Now, uh, one of the things I find rather tantalizing um, is the fact that when, in, in one very important verse in Luke, it's in, in Luke 20, 21, uh, in where Yeshua is presented as, as talking about the destruction of Jerusalem uh, and uh, speaks about the Jerusalem being trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Um, in, in, the, in that very verse, uh, he says that the people will be uh, put to the sword and taken captive. So some of uh, the, the, the Jewish people are simply m murdered by the Romans. And some of them, as we know, are, are taken to Rome. And so we have this, uh, the Arch of Titus, you know, and um, this, this, you know, uh, and in fact, uh, his, many historians say, you know, that it was, there were probably uh, thousands of Jew Jewish slaves involved in the building of the Colosseum. Well, I am just wonder if Luke is not making, just as he makes Yeshua anticipate the suffering of the Jewish people in 70 through his death as one who was slain, whether he's not portraying Paul who, as also expressing his, his loyalty, his solidarity and participation in the Jewish people 
through being taken captive and brought to Rome as an anticipation of the Jewish exiles who will be brought, uh, brought to Rome. And again, then it becomes so striking in all of those speeches between Acts 21 and, and 28, the way Paul is continually repeating about his loyalty um, uh, and how he hasn't done anything um, you know, against his people. So, so. Pa Paul is a corporate representative? With, yeah, through his participation, through his kind of um, recapitulating the story of Yeshua. Mm, it seems to me more likely that what you have here is Acts playing that out because you have death by the sword, which would be James who gets put to death by Herod Agrippa the first, and then you have Paul, the example of the one taken oh, in chains. Yeah, I just made that up, but I think I'm right. Yeah, that, but that <laughs> but that works too. They but then they they simply become, um, in at least in the way I'm reading. You know Luke's approach to the to the death of Yeshua. Mm -hmm. They become two um, the two disciples of the Master, who yeah. are entering in to his suffering, which then becomes a suffering, again that is like a participation in uh, in in what uh, the Jewish people are experiencing, um, rather than again an over against thing. You know, um, so. Uh, Talk a little bit more about suffering and yes. value and in suffering very and good. all that stuff that bothers me. That was my next, uh, my next point, uh, which I, I, this is a really important and difficult point. Uh, and uh, I don't know that I can uh, treat it in a, in a satisfactory way. Uh, but I would want to clarify something about what I'm saying about w what I think Luke is saying. Uh, I don't think... I, I'm not arguing that Luke's approach is, um, in the way you put it, a kind of ends justifies the means. In other words, that, that Luke is, is, is deliberately saying this is the way we have, in, in order to get to this end point, this is the way it has to be. Instead, and, and this is something I argue within the book as a whole, it's got to do, I think, with Luke's approach to history. Uh, and God's work in history, which I also in the book tie to Gamaliel's speech, um, which I think integrates human action and human decisions, human agency, into the overarching story so that it's human beings acting badly uh, and not responding po positively that lead to all kinds of terrible experiences. And, and that's, it's not that that's a means that God is simply choosing in order to get somewhere. It is God then entering into the picture and bringing good out of evil. You know, kind of like in the book of Genesis, what happens with um, Joseph, the story of Joseph. You know, uh, that it, uh, it's, it wasn't a good thing that Joseph's brothers sell him. In, it, it, was an, it was simply an evil thing. But God then knits that into this broader story which ultimately leads both to, in a sense, the salvation of the Egyptians and to uh, the, and the preservation of the, of, of the family um, of, of Joseph. And when I argue in the book, I actually talk about the way the story of Joseph gets treated um, in, uh, I think, it's Stephen's speech um, and how that Joseph story, I think, actually is part of the way in which Luke treats all of these things. And so, um, I see, uh, you know, that I, that's how I'm, I relate to then, you know, the, the notion of the redemptive suffering. The suffering is going to be there anyways. The question is, um, can the suffering that's there simply as a result of the brokenness of the world and the sinful actions of human beings somehow be overseen by God such that God brings good uh, out of the evil? I think that's what the cross itself is. Um, and then um, the suffering of the Jewish people. You know, th thinking again, the hardest case which you bring up, the impossible case for it to be able to talk about is the Shoah. And, you know, we can never talk about the Shoah as a means to an end. You know, it's, it's simply an unmitigated tragedy. On the other hand, on the other side of the Shoah, we see a chastened church that has a, 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 which has had a dramatically different attitude towards the Jewish people, which we've talked about over these last few days, and opened the door to a different type of scholarship, 
um, and a different kind of reading of the, of the New Testament, and opened the door to the establishment of the state of Israel. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say, it's, it's not a question of, you know, that the, to posit the Shoah as this necessary means to achieve this, these other ends. But in the midst of this terrible, terrible evil, God, in his redemptive mercy, acts, um, you know, and, 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 you know, brings something, something out of it. Is that helpful at all? <laughs> Uh, it's what I thought you were going to say. Um, you know, I, I think to get there, you have to be a theologian to begin with, and you have to be able to justify the God in whom you worship. Um, since I'm not a theologian, and I tend to like the book of Job a whole lot, and Job says, you know what, there may be no value in this suffering whatsoever, and don't try to justify it. And I find that to be more, what, theologically satisfying. Because otherwise, I'm back to the idea that the end justifies the means. And I, and I know you're not saying that, but that's the conclusion I draw from the examples that you provide, even though you don't draw that conclusion. Um, and for me, the redemption that you find is insufficient compensation for the deaths that happened. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think it's compensation at all. Yeah. That's, that's why I just don't think that's the way we should conceive of it. Right. I mean, we do, we do have, and this goes back to other Second Temple texts and even to the prophets, the idea that God can use enemy nations, their destruction, to work divine ends. So you know, God works yeah. through, uh, you know, the Romans or the Babylonians and whoever. Um, and I find that, uh, you know, if you're in the system and you want to continue your theology, then, yeah. then you have to come up with that because you've got nothing else. Yeah. Um, I, my side of the historical divide when I'm past that is I, that's not the sort of God I want to worship. Yeah. Yes. So that's my own theological problem. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you. Let's keep this uh, discussion going. All right. <laughs> Let's keep this discussion going and draw, draw you in, uh, the audience. Uh, we'll start with our usual Q&A approach of standing in line, which is already getting set up, and you can address your questions to either Dr. Levine or Dr. Kinzer or both. Could, and, can I make, uh, yeah. I, I, it's just a proposal, you have to, if you don't want to do it this way, don't okay. do it this way, obviously. But um, part of what AJ did was she formulated these, a set of questions, really. And they weren't just questions for me, they were questions for us. Yeah. And, um, I'm, I'm not proposing that we simply open things up to people giving speeches, but I would think that if people have short comments On that are questions. responses to things that have been said, if you're open to it, I certainly would welcome it. Yeah, let, we actually have that yeah. in the um, uh, program is times of, of discussion, which we, ha we haven't done yet. So let's do uh, up to a half hour of Q&A, then we'll have a half hour of uh, Discussion. I'll give some guidelines for that, but that would be a good. Those would be good prompts. Yeah, I want to uh, just put two cents into this Gamaliel question. Um, reading the early rabbinical material from the second, first half of the first century, about the hatred and the enmity and kotviut. Um, polarization inside the, the, the community of Israel between Amaaretz and the Pharisees and within the Pharisees between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel and the Sadducees and the whole thing, the hatred that existed there got to the point to, that at some point they called the Sanhedrin Beit Din Katlani. In other words, uh, in English I would say uh, a, a killing Sanhedrin, in other words, uh, happy to kill, something like that, happy to execute. And uh, Gamliel, suddenly, he's got two prisoners accused of rather not so simple accusation. In the atmosphere that existed at that time of hatred between this group and the other group and the, and the easy uh, finger on the trigger uh, against one another, where it says, you know, even, even later, 
Rabbi Akiva says, if I had a chance to bite Amha Aretz, I would give him a bite of a donkey. Yeah. It's pretty hateful, right? It's not so simple. In that kind of atmosphere for Gamliel to uh, come up with, a, with a, an idea to release Peter and John with this, I would say, excuse that if it's from God, it will remain, and if not, not, it's a very big deal. And now there are people writing articles and books that the Pharisees were not really against the disciples of Yeshua, but more the Sadducees are to blame. There is, th that atmosphere now in the academic community exists. So maybe we should think about Gamliel a little more, um, that he didn't do it by accident. That, what, what, that the release of Peter and John and his reason for the release had more to it than meets the eye. At least that's my, my opinion. Yeah. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. The, the book that is uh, important to understand is Kochi Meshichosh uh, Akiva, The Messiah of Akiva by Kochi. Uh, Uh, anyway, her, her first name is Kochi, Kochava, but uh, she, she wrote a book, The Messiah of Akiva, and in that book she describes this atmosphere that existed at that time. And I think that I'm, when I read the story of, of uh, uh, the release of Peter and John from, the, from jail by Gamliel, I think that it, it reflects a, a, a special attitude that Gamliel had toward the disciples of Yeshua, and, and whatever excuse he used to release them, <laughs> he had the, the, a good reason in his own mind to do it. All right, thank you. Russ, can I just say something brief? Yeah, a brief response um, and then the question. Yeah, one of the things I would, I would just point out there, I think the kind of thing that Joe is bringing up is a, is a, is a valuable point, uh, and, uh, but I also want to make clear again the distinction between that, what, what Joe is pursuing there and the kind of um, agenda I'm pursuing uh, in that, um, and I'm underlying because again, I'm trying, I want to emphasize so you can understand what I'm doing. I'm not trying to focus on the history of, that, of Gamal, what, what did Gamaliel actually say and why did he do it? In some ways, in, in my intentions in, in this book and in my research, I'm kind of, um, uh, that's, that's not relevant. I'm asking, what is, how, wh how is he being depicted <laughs> here? And wh why in this way? Um, because even if it is historically accurate, uh, every historian is always making a selection and, and uh, you know, de depicting thing in a certain way for a certain purpose. And so um, that's the, I I'm more consider concerned about the history in the post-70 period here rather than the pre-70 period. Thank you. Okay, this is towards Mark. You said that the Messianic Jewish social location is a hermeneutical asset. And in Finding Our Net Way Through Nicaea, you talk about the Messianic Jewish hermeneutic. Can you expand more? Are you talking the same thing? What's the difference or just some points that you could pass on? Yes. Well, what I... Yeah, there's something in, I, I had a longer form of this paper, which uh, I probably will still ultimately submit when the Borough Park papers are um, published. Uh, and in the longer form, I was going to actually compare the, the, the kind of fundamental non-negotiable uh, axioms of, Messianic Jewish, uh, the Messianic Jewish social location, to the the axioms of the the wider Jewish world, the at least the religious Jewish world, traditional Jewish world, and and the Christian world, uh, 
because all of them, you know, the church is itself a social location uh, that operates with a set of uh, axioms which govern how it engages with, with the text. And, you know, the fundamental one, which I bring out in the, in the Nicaea paper, is Christological. You know, it, it has to do with uh, the, uh, uh, the centrality of Yeshua or the, the deity of Yeshua, the redemptive life of, uh, of Yeshua. Uh, and then it has to do with the uh, authoritative nature of, of scripture as a whole and its coherence. And then it, the kind of conclusion uh, uh, being uh, that this whole text of scripture witnesses to that Yeshua, that Christological reality. It's not an exegetical conclusion. It's a beginning axiom. Uh, the, the, the church finds Yeshua in the text because it comes to the text with, with Yeshua. Um, uh, and Yeshua is already living in the life uh, of the community um, that comes to him. This, the Jewish people has a similar thing, uh, I think. It's simply, it's, it's rooted more in its understanding of the covenant with Israel. Um, the Torah as the embodiment uh, of, of that uh, covenant um, and of God's presence in the midst of Israel. It's the sort of thing that Carl was talking about um, mm -hmm. when he was talking about Midrash. You know, it's like Midrash isn't just a technique, um, although it, it has its own, it's governed by its own principles and rules. Um, the community starts, the, the sages start with a, a, a set of unquestionable axioms about God's presence in the midst of Israel and about the, the, the role of the Torah. And then they find it in, 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 in the text. Um, and historically, these two communities have existed through affirming those core truths and then denying the, the, the truths of the other community. And that what I argue about the unique nature of our social location is that we're affirming both um, of these, uh, the Christological and the Israelological, um, and in fact, superimposing one upon the other. That's very helpful, thank you. Can I say something about that? That raises a really interesting question on what this hermeneutic is. So I get the point about non-negotiables, and I get the point about the concern for scripture, and I get the point about Christology in Israel, but is, would you, is there a single messianic hermeneutic um, and what, because I'm thinking there's not, because you're no. Jews, so you know, that would um, But the other thing is, in your high view of scripture, does it have to be that everything that, you know, if scripture puts something in red letters, does it mean that that has to be historically fact? Or does your messianic hermeneutic allow for gospel writers to massage history in order to present a more midrashic view? Because this also goes back to yeah. Joseph's point about if the text said it, then it yeah. kind of happened. Exactly. Are you yeah. there? I'm not, but I, there would be people here who are. Where this is a diver, there's a diversity of opinion and approach within the Messianic Jewish movement um, uh, as to those issues of historicity and how important those those factors are, or about the amount of um, messiness we're willing to tolerate um, in terms of tensions internal to the text. But it's one thing to be able to say there are tensions in the text and we don't even understand how they go together, they're resolved in any way, but that we come to the text not believing that, they, that there's a coherence here even if we don't see it. So if I were to say, for example, and this goes back to the earlier talk, uh, that Jesus never actually said don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans, just go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, that that's Matthean redaction. Would that fly among any Messianic community or is that too much of a, no, we can't go here? Uh, it would fly for some and for many it wouldn't. I would say probably the minority would not take, or excuse me, the majority would not, would be more traditional in, in their approach um, to the text, but you will find um, Messianic Jewish leaders and congregations who would have no problem with that. Uh, thank you guys both for the presentations. Um, uh, I kind of want to go back to the, the discussion you guys were starting to have on uh, theodicy essentially. And I, the reason why is I think, and I'm hoping you'll continue kind of discussing it because uh, it's uh, a very practical issue as, as you brought up, Dr. Levine, um, 
Levine, sorry. Uh, uh, you know, when families interact and one becomes a believer in Jesus and they're Jewish and like the messiness, and let alone for all of us as Jewish people, the horrors of our history essentially. And so um, what I kind of wanted to bring up is um, I'm understanding, like I'm very comfortable with like uh, Dr. Levine, your uh, feeling like the explanation that Dr. Kinzer said is like unfulfilling and you mentioned Job, but I don't think, uh, you know, Barakot 7 doesn't give a confident answer either. I don't think like, I don't actually think there is a, anything that can give us like a wholesome feeling about suffering. And, uh, and on the contrary, the idea that this, uh, that Jesus, who for Jewish people would be like totally like not related to us, as uh, Dr. Kinzer points out, came and suffered and bore, like, bore the Jewish people's pain, the Jerusalem pain, honestly is uh, to think that God himself suffered with the Jews in that way is, is like a very uh, tragically beautiful thing. And so I was just, I was trying to say like, I, I feel like the discussion on theodicy is good to have practically and then like for the unity of Jewish people. So I was hoping to kind of encourage you guys to continue that discussion. Yeah, thanks. Um, in case I was not clear, um, I, I, I see where the idea of Jesus entering into solidarity with not only his people, but with humankind in order for general redemption. That's not, that's not just a Jewish thing. And by, by New Testament terms, that's a universal thing. I get that, right? Um, and there's a logic to it, and I can understand in, in, a, in a certain way that it is, in fact, beautiful. I find that to be a difference where Jesus had a choice. It is through his faith that he does that. He didn't have to do it, right? If it be your will, let this cup pass from me. And then he decides to surrender to what he sees as God's will. That's lovely. That's not the same thing as, as putting, a, putting somebody who had no choice in the matter whatsoever and saying that, that somehow that suffering is also redemptory. That's where I have the problem. Uh, so sorry, I just to follow up. So the is the because I would think like the choice because it's God is more of a like an amazing thing, right? Because like he obviously doesn't have to suffer, and it's God; he can do whatever he wants, right? So, um, uh, like I thought the choice is what makes it like beautiful in a way. Like it is what makes that connection interesting. Um, but to you, you find the the choice like frustrating because is not comparable to someone, like you said, who doesn't no, have I, a choice? I think, I think for Jesus, or for Paul, or for Peter, or for James, I'm not sure there was a Stephen, but if there were, for Stephen, um, because it is a matter of choice, and it shows just how profound their belief system is, because they're dying for something in which they believe. And that's what makes them martyrs. They are witnesses. That's what martyr means, right? They're witnesses to the point of death. That's incredibly inspirational. That's not the same thing as a baby being killed. I don't want those two merged together. That's my problem. Uh, my comment, question, is, more, is a follow-up of this one, but it actually was sitting here already. And um, I think the, the word redemption doesn't necessarily encompass the, the act because you know, bad things happen, as we all know, and good things can come of them. And it doesn't mean that it's a response. It is a response, but it's not, uh, it's not, it's caused by it, but it's not, it's not supposed to equal it out. It's not supposed to purge the bad thing. Uh, you know, whether it's, uh, whether it's just someone's bad luck, you know, you know I, I have children with special needs, I have one without, she's growing up to be a wonderful, caring, sympathetic uh, young child, young girl, as a, as a result. Doesn't mean that the children with special needs is a good thing, but there, there is a positive outcome due to that situation. Likewise, in, we have in the Bible, of course, in Exodus, we see that... Um, that God used the hardening of Pharaoh's heart for his glory. So sometimes there is a divine use of things and even a divine uh, direction that is then results in his glory or 
positive benefit, whether it's redemptive or not, we can see that it's positive. No need for a response. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, I'm having a little problem with what I think you said, so maybe first clarify, so see if I heard you correctly, Mark, that the Baruch Haba, are you saying there was no answer to that? That that, that wasn't that that wasn't the event we've been looking for. Yeah, what I was saying was that in in Luke thirteen, uh, Yeshua is, is he's not in Jerusalem. It's before he's come to Jerusalem. He's on on the way, and. But he's anticipating, um, and he's, he's just been warned, you know, by Pharisees that Herod is out to get him. Um, and he says, don't worry about it, because a, pro a prophet can't perish outside of Jerusalem. And then that leads him to then look and, towards that day and to say, to mourn over Jerusalem, 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 city that stones the prophet, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how often would I, would I have gathered you? And then um, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Um, and uh, what I tend to think, uh, I, I tend to follow the scholarly trajectory that sees this as one of those texts like um, Adolfo was re referring to earlier, that it's Yeshua speaking prophetically. He's speaking about God, um, you know, and uh, in that, the, and, the, so then we come to Luke 19, and Yeshua is entering into the city from the Mount of Olives um, and marching into the city, um, and he's being hailed as Bar with the words Baruch HaBab Hashem Right. But he's not being hailed by Jerusalem. It, 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 he's being hailed by his disciples, which Luke is explicit in saying. Um, and so we sometimes have this image, the people coming out from the city and welcoming him, but that's not what happens in Luke. Uh, in Luke, it's very, very clear. It's the disciples of Yeshua who are accompanying him, who are the ones who welcome him in this way. So they're, they're not welcoming him into their city. They are basically accompanying him and hailing the one who they've already received as their master. But um, the city hasn't welcomed him, and... Uh, and that's why he stops in Luke at that point and weeps. He weeps over the city. And then at that point, he issues another anticipation of the destruction of the, the, destruction the city is going to have in 70. Um, if, 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 in Luke, this is not just a great scene of, of jubilation. It's a scene of grief. Um, so yeah, I think the, uh, the great en the entry is, is a kind of non-triumphal entry in, in, in Luke, and but what it's pointing to, it's a kind of preview of a day when, which mm -hmm. will be the grand entry, when Yeshua returns, where his feet rest on the Mount of Olives, and where the city does come out um, to welcome him, and it is the city and its leaders saying, Baruch right. Baba Shem. Okay, so I thought, I did hear you clear. Uh, I, I, that's the part I, I have a problem with, is that I just want to make sure I understood what you were saying. I think there's a, a there, that's not the only interpretation of who was there and what the crowd was doing. There's more going on there. It's a pretty amazing crowd. And even though there are the, it, his disciples, I, I'm not convinced that that's exclusively only his disciples. Yeah, but you have to, again, David, what you're doing, I think, and I want to again point it out to you, is you're going back to try to say what happened on Palm Sunday. You're, and you're thinking in terms of the event. I'm not talking about what happened on Palm Sunday. I'm simply talking about what Luke is trying to say in the way he's describing what happened on Palm Sunday. But um, and the alternate, I'm try, what I'm trying to say is, yeah. why is that Baruch Haba when he says the rocks will cry out? What, that is part of the people who did receive him, 
right? These are whoever that is that's saying Baruch Habat, it's not the whole of our people receiving him, but it is what we would all call the messianic remnant. And isn't yes. there a confirmation of who he is in that statement, including yeah. the, the, the last Seder of the Messiah with his disciples? Yes, I, no, it's, it's not, yes. It, 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 the, the point there is, this is related to something else that um, I was gonna respond to AJ about. Luke, I think, distinguishes carefully at times between the city of Jerusalem and the Jewish people as a whole. The, the city of Jerusalem represents the people as a whole. And it, it's, it, it, you might say Jer Jerusalem to the, si to the people is like parallel to like the leaders of the community in Rome, to the, the Jewish community in Rome. Um, and so they're, they're, they're closely, closely connected. Um, so that I, I don't think when, when uh, in the speech of Acts, when um, you know, Peter uh, is saying, you killed. I don't think he's speaking to Israel. It is Jerusalem. Because w when Paul then speaks in, in, uh, in the diaspora, in his speech in Acts 13, he uses the third person. It's no longer you. He's not speaking to, it's not the Jews who, who or Israel that kills him. It's Jerusalem and the leader, leaders in Jerusalem. He makes that very clear distinction so that you're, you're right. It's not the Jewish people as a whole. The disciples are Jews. Their acclaiming of him is a, is a partly a response, um, the first fruits of what Israel will respond, but it's not Jerusalem. And so that's what's you, key to the story. Are anyway. you Let, saying that... It, hold on. Yeah. Let's get some more questions. All right. To, I want to ask a hermeneutical question because I'm here and I have a mic. Um, so, did, okay. did you... When, when, so when the Pharisees come up to him and they say, Antipas wants you, and he talks about the fox yeah. and... Blah, blah, you think that's benevolent rather than malevolent? Yes. Okay, so that's a hermeneutical choice. Yes. Uh, because you can read the same passages okay. to say he, they're trying to thwart him from getting to Jerusalem and trying to abort the mission. Yeah. So it's a hermeneutical yeah. choice again. Okay. Yeah. I'm really enjoying this dialogue, but I have a, um, no, really honestly, this is excellent. And so this, to limit everything to one question, this question is for Dr. Levine. When you were giving the examples of the way Luke Acts treats Israel. My question, as I was thinking about some of the examples that you gave is what role does viewing this as an intra-Jewish dialogue play in the understanding here? Like, do you, see, you know, um, do you see this primarily polemical or do you see this as some of these comments being, you know, because you can be stronger in in-group dynamics than you would in a different kind of a situation, so. Yeah, I don't think it's an in-group thing. I, I think it's Luke targeting out toward a predominantly Gentile church, rehearsing what was at the time an in-group, you know, it's, it's Jesus and other Jews doing what Jews do, uh, quite vociferously. Um, but for me, what Luke is doing, and, and here, whether this is historical or not, I don't know, but this is the story world of Luke Acts. I get really nervous that after chapter 21, that entire Jewish believing community goes away. And I don't know why they're not there to help Paul, and they should have been. And I don't know why Luke silences them, and I get the impression from a literary critical perspective that Luke is saying, that was then, this is now, they are no more, and the future is Paul heading out toward the Gentile world, and nothing's gonna come of that whole Jewish-based Jerusalem thing until the parousias are just let it go. That's my concern. But I don't think Luke is writing intra-polemic. I think Luke is writing well after that intra the predominance of that intra-polemic had already stopped. And now we have communities talking with each other. Part of the, the difficulty is, is what Freud would call the narcissism of minor differences, right? The closer you are, the more you have to exaggerate where you're distinct. And the Messianic community and who, what became, became the heirs of the Pharisees, they look a lot alike. So then you have to emphasize, but I don't think it's an, inter for Luke, I don't think it's an internal emphasis. I think the stance of the author and the stance of the, the story world, the separation has already occurred in the sense of Luke's targeting outward toward Theophilus, who's coming off like, more like a Gentile patron than he is like a yeshiva bacha. 
I just have a, a brief comment to offer in uh, AJ, if, uh, if I may, in response to your heartfelt observations about the issue of redemption and suffering. I'm also a fan of the, of the Book of Job. And I see that uh, after the feeble rationalizations of the so-called comforters are brushed away, that when God finally shows up, God does not answer any of Job's questions. Correct. Shows up with God's presence. And in the sense of uh, the question of redemptive suffering and what would say in the presence of a burning child, anybody that thinks that he or she has an adequate answer to the question of that unasked for suffering would um, probably be better off not saying anything. I would agree with that. Right. Yeah. Even though there may be an answer, we on this side of things do not, I do not think have the right to, um, to say what it is. I, I completely agree with you. My concern is for me, the implications of Mark's readings actually provide a partial answer, and it's not a partial answer I'm prepared to accept. Whereas, um, in, in some ways, I'm, I was certainly struck by uh, Yaakov's um, presentation yesterday and you know, thinking again about Israeli art and the, um, the identification with, uh, with Yeshua uh, and, the, and something similar, of course, that one finds in Chagall and uh, and, uh, but once again there, it's, it's finding some kind of uh, strength or comfort through the connection between the two, but it is not a way of, of somehow or another justifying or uh, saying that this suffering is, is intrinsically valuable. Right. Or it's co-opting Jesus for the Jewish agenda and condemning his Gentile followers, right? Yeah. And these are not mutually exclusive. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Rabbi Mark, you mentioned that the author of Luke Acts sees some hope in the development of Pharisaism into s something later. And I was just wondering if you could expand on that. Well, uh, one of the things I, I do in, uh, in the book, in Jerusalem Crucified, uh, is I'm, uh, I'm arguing that Luke is a, is a theologian, a kind of prophetic theologian who reflects upon history and who is seeking to try to understand something of what God is doing uh, in, in the historical circumstances that, uh, that, he, that, that he is encountering and has encountered uh, and that have taken place in the 40 or 50 years before him. Uh, and then what I'm, what I'm also arguing though is that for us, what we should take from that is not simply the results of his reflection on the, the first century history. That what we need to do is the same thing he did. In other words, that he's modeling something for us of, uh, of an approach to history, which means that we now have to do for the last 2,000 years what Luke did for the, you know, the 40 to 50, 60 years between the death and the resurrection of Yeshua and the, uh, the time when, when he was writing. Um, and so I see, I'm arguing both about that Luke is opening this intriguing door to the, the possibility that there's something positive brewing in the Jewish community uh, of his day with the new role that the, that the, Phar the Pharisees are playing and with the end of uh, the uh, Sadducean uh, rule uh, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, but then I'm going beyond that in the book. I'm saying, okay, now we have to look at our history of the last 19 centuries 
and we have to try to make some sense of it. Uh, not that we will have answers or be able to say this is exactly what God was doing, but we have to make some sort of sense of this. And uh, for, for me, uh, what I see is that this tradition that uh, emerged from, uh, that identified Gamaliel as, as one of its founders, was the source of the preservation of Jewish life uh, and, and the Jewish people. Uh, and, and in fact, what I argue in the book is that it even became the means of preserving key elements of the gospel message itself. That the gospel message became fractured uh, because key elements of the gospel message had to do with the, re the restoration of Israel and uh, the, the, uh, you know, the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Um, and the connection between the, 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 the resurrection of Yeshua and, and uh, you know, Israel's future redemption. Um, so that that part of the, of the gospel message itself gets carried within the Jewish tradition. Uh, and, and so I think that uh, we have to do, as I said, for these last 19 centuries, what Luke did in his period. We have to reflect what was God doing in that and what does that mean for how we relate to the Jewish tradition and, and how we relate to the Christian tradition? Um, because God was also preserving something essential through, through the church. Um, and then that leads us again to the point that AJ point, uh, underlined, which was the sense of two covenant partners that are in, in need of one another. And part of our role as Messianic Jews is, is in sense to be heirs of both of these traditions and to help um, help each of them find one another. Thank you. Is this a question? Yes. OK, so this will be a last question, okay. and then we'll take about 15, 20 minutes for some discussion. Uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Levine, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on the motif of blindness in Luke and Acts, particularly in how it relates to um, Luke's portrayal of Jewish followers of Jesus, because as you noted on the Emmaus Road, essentially his own disciples are blind, and you get this um, throughout the Gospels, and uh, or throughout uh, Luke and Acts, and Paul himself encounters and has his own blindness overcome, and it's, it's just particularly interesting to me that the Gospel, or that Acts ends with this kind of comment about blindness, and uh, Jesus' inaugural sermon involves the overcoming of blindness, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a great question, and it's, it's coming up now, especially considering disability studies in the Gospels and how you talk about um, uh, differently abled individuals. Um, there is, as far as I can tell, because I've actually spent some time looking at this, um, looking at, uh, <laughs> our metaphors betray us, um, the, um, there's no single way that this is used. Um, so sometimes it's utilitarian uh, in Luke 4 to give sight to the blind and then Jesus gives sight to the blind. So that's kind of a playing out of the Messianic mission. Um, Paul, uh, the two on the road to Emmaus are unable to see they're, they're, uh, until you get this. So it's divine blindness um, and then divine sight. Uh, and even Bible study doesn't get you there. So, so what is it that's going to get you through? Um, Paul becomes blind on the road to, uh, on the Damascus, it's like stay off the road. Um, so Paul becomes blind um, on the road to Damascus. But then again, what was his name? Elimas, where Paul actually blinds somebody? You know, boy, don't cross an apostle. Um, so it can function as metaphor, it can function as punishment, uh, it can function as an idea of enlightenment. Sometimes it's temporary, and I wonder if with others it becomes permanent so that seeing they won't see and hearing they won't hear and that's the end of it. And that's the Luke and repurposing of the quote that you get connected to the parables in Matthew and Mark and Luke simply you know, shoves it up toward the end. Um, and I don't know whether Luke sees that as a permanent thing until some sort of eschatological eye surgery. So it doesn't work out evenly each time you see it because each time you see it, it's, it's having a different narrative function. Right. That was, oh, by the way, that was, sorry, that was also the case in antiquity because sometimes, like in the case of Teresius, the blind prophet, um, sometimes blindness is what in fact gives you insight hmm. because you look internally as well as externally. And if you look at in relation to earlier examples of blindness, sometimes blindness is just blindness. Um, Isaac is blind. It's not a punishment. Um, you know, it's a potential disability because he gets the kids confused, maybe. Um, 
but it's, it's also, you know, it's, it's, it's what happens when you get old. So even when you look at individual examples of blindness, you have to figure out exactly how they're functioning. Thank you. <laughs>